Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the PALS live lecture series. And this afternoon, we have been tasked by PALS to share with you um, updates on torts and damages. Um, first, uh, let me just congratulate Muna, all the takers, the passers, as well as the top notchers of the 2019 bar examinations um, chaired by Justice um, Stella Perlas Bernabe. Um, Actually, I really personally see Bernabar as a story of, of hope. Working students from the provinces stopping the bar examinations, examinees not making it the first time, yet um, trying again and landing in the top 10. So congrats, everyone. I hope that the new lawyers will stay in the community where their law schools are. At what a way of giving back to the community. And those who didn't make it uh, in this year's bar will hopefully take again the next bar examinations. Um, let's not let this setback uh, set us back. Let's have this setback set us up for something greater. Um, I'm just reminded of that Japanese uh, proverb that says, fall down seven times, um, get up eight. So I think. Okay, and let me also uh, first um, say a word of thanks to the Philippine Association of Law Schools headed by Dean Mary. Um, it was Dean Mary's idea that um, we have this uh, Pulse Live lecture series and she was ably, ably assisted by Dean Alshwade uh, for the technical aspects as well as the pub maths, as well as our executive director, um, attorney Janice Ramos. May I also thank uh, Dean Gonzaga for the moral support, uh, Dean uh, Viv of UE and Dean Sol for the pagod luck um, itong live lecture series. So having said that, um, let me start. Um, this lecture discussion actually on torts and damages um, came about because um, with the ECQ, we had some time in our hands. Uh, the ECQ has actually given us the opportunity to update our book on torts and damages um, published by Rex Bookstore. So I'd actually be highlighting some of the um, changes. Uh, governing torts and damages um, as announced in the cases that had been decided by the court. And there had been many cases that had either overturned uh, existing doctrines or modified um, those uh, relating to torts as well as damages. So that would be the sharing. Let me start um, the presentation. So this one's on torts and damages. Um, recent, we have seen in recent uh, bar examinations, the interest of the bar examiners on the aspect of torts and damages, for instance, in this 2012 bar examination, question number one is um, on torts and damages. And it even carried a hefty 5% um, in, the, in, the in, the in the civil law bar exam. So we will start with introductory concepts because um, we cannot really dive into the uh, complex matters without uh, having a firm foundation. So as always, um, I'd like us to know the end, uh, have an idea of the end in mind. What is really the role and function of our torts law? Um, I'd like to make a special emphasis on the fact that it's not really just for compensation. There is also the aspect of loss distribution. And that I think would play a significant part for when we examine the law, for instance, on special torts, whereby possessors of animals are required by the, by the law to indemnify uh, uh, the person who had been damaged as a matter of loss distribution, as well as the liability of an employer for acts or omission of the employees. So these are the matters we need to take, uh, take into consideration as a context for when the Supreme Court decides uh, cases using our torts law. In the, in the model curriculum prescribed by the Legal Education Board in 2011. We look at torts and damages as one that has been described to be a study of the nature 
and concept of quasi-delic. So I think that the first question we need to address is, would tort be similar to quasi-delic? Cases decided by the court would tell us, of course, it is not. Tort is common law in origin, whereas our quasi-delic is civil. And there are several implications, legal implications, for when we say that tort is different from quasi-delic in that tort is common law in origin or concept. Because it is common law, it can cover any legal wrong. Whereas uh, quasi-delic um, whereas quasi-delic is based on the definition fixed by law. So concept, it can cover all wrongful acts, intentional or unintentional. For instance, it is considered tort. Um, if for, uh, the, the, the optional acts such as battery, assault, false imprisonment, intentional infliction of emotional distress, defamation, malicious prosecution, abuse of processes, or trespass to land. Um, in sharp contrast, we look at quasi-delic to be one that is uh, based on the definition fixed by law being a civil law um, concept. And so we turn to Article 2176 of the Civil Code for when we want to know what is quasi-delic. And in 2176, um, the core of, the, of quasi-delic as a concept is really founded on fault or negligence. And it says, whoever by act or omission causes damage to another, there being fault or negligence is obliged to pay for the damage done. So when we look at the definition, we... Um, think of the concept of fault. And we know we have encountered the concept of fault in many of the um, legal principles in law. For instance, we see fault or we encounter the concept of fault or culpa in Article uh, 3 of the Revised Penal Code as well as our, uh, Title 14 of RPC. And so we ask the question, if quasi-delic as found in Article 2176 covers uh, negligent acts, can quasi-delic also cover negligent acts that are in themselves considered criminal acts under our Revised Penal Code? Um, so just as a brief review. We look at Article 3 RPC and it says there are two ways of committing a crime. One is through deceit or dolo and the other is through fault or culpa. Deceit is when an act is performed with deliberate intent and there is fault when the act is performed not with intent but with imprudence, negligence, lack of foresight or lack of skill. So when we think therefore of one negligent act, we think of the possibility of filing a criminal case for reckless imprudence under Title 4, 14 of the RPC. And in fact, we call that culpa criminal. And that same negligent act is in fact also addressed by Article 2176 of the Civil Code, thereby bringing about a civil action for damages also um, based on quasi-delic known as culpa aquiliana. So the question is, you have culpa criminal and culpa aquiliana covering one and the same negligent act. We first ask ourselves the question, would culpa aquiliana and culpa criminal be the same? And the 1942 case of Barredo versus Garcia would tell us they are not. Um, the long and short of it is while culpa criminal covers or affects the public interest, culpa aquiliana is only a matter of private concern. And then there's also the aspect of um, quantum of proof or uh, that's needed or burden of proof that's needed to prove each of the cases. You'd have culpa criminal being a criminal case to be um, falling under the proof beyond reasonable doubt requirement, whereas you have culpa aquiliana being civil falling under the preponderance of evidence requirement. Um, but there's a very important pronouncement made by the court in 1942 about culpa aquiliana and culpa criminal. It says, there is a separate individuality of culpa criminal and culpa aquiliana under the civil code. And this precisely is significant for when we think of whether we can file two separate cases affecting one and the same negligent act. So we pose the question for one negligent act. Can the aggrieved party file a criminal case for reckless imprudence, culpa criminal, and a separate civil case for quasi-delic or culpa aquiliana? 
um, in Article 2177 of the Civil Code, the separateness and the distinct uh, character of culpa aquiliana had already been highlighted. It says responsibility for negligence under Article 2176 is separate and distinct, entirely separate and distinct from the civil liability arising from negligence under the penal code. And so because they are different, that one negligent act can in fact give rise to two possible cases. We see this illustration in the case of Manliklik versus Kalaunan, a 2007 case. In this case, um, a criminal case was first filed for, neg for the negligent act of Manliklik. And then later on, a, a civil case for Culpa Aquiliana, complaint for damages, was filed against the same Manliklik in a separate RTC. Um, during, in the course of the trial, uh, Manliklik was acquitted in the criminal case. And the question then that was posed was, what is the effect of Manliklik's acquittal in the criminal case with the civil aspect, with the civil case rather, that was filed not for um, culpa uh, criminal, but for culpa aquiliana. So the court there said, in spite of the acquittal of Manliklik, he can still be held liable under quasi delict because his acquittal may have extinguished the civil liability arising from the crime, but his civil liability arising from quasi delic has not been extinguished. Um, the court explained that this has to be so because quasi delic is a separate legal institution with substantivity all its own and individuality all its own, entirely apart and independent from a delic or crime. Here is in fact the bold pronouncement of the court. In other words, if the accused is acquitted based on reasonable doubt, his civil liability arising from crime may be proved by preponderance of evidence only. But if the accused is acquitted on the basis that he was not the author of the crime or that uh, there is a declaration that the fact from which the civil liability might arise did not exist, such acquittal closes the door to civil liability that is based on crime or ex delicto. But if the civil liability is now based on tort, that can still be instituted on grounds because it is based on a delic other than the delict complained of. So here's what the court said. If the accused is acquitted in the criminal case, in culpa criminal case, uh, that acquittal will not affect at all the civil case for culpa aquiliana. The responsibility arising from fault or negligence in quasi delic is entirely separate and distinct from civil liability arising from negligence under the penal code. And in fact, his acquittal or his conviction in the criminal case is entirely irrelevant in the civil case that is based on culpa aquiliana. Um, Manliklik a 2007 case was cite, cited by the Supreme Court in 2017 in Kapanzana case. So it still is a good law. It was in fact also alluded to that same principle was in fact also said in the case of Lumantas versus Calapis, which was decided in January 15, 2014. So since we can institute a culpa criminal and a culpa aquiliana case based on one negligent act, is there even a need to make reservation to file independent civil action of quasi delic in the criminal case for reckless imprudence? We turn to Rule 111 of the revised rules on criminal procedure on questions pertaining to reservations. And here, um, the, the provision has been worded in this way. Uh, those civil actions under 32, 33, 34, and 2176, which is our Culpa Aquiliana case, uh, the independent civil action may be brought uh, by the offended party and it shall proceed independently of the criminal action. 
um, as interpreted by the court in many cases and recently in the case of Supreme Transportation Liner versus San Andres, a 2018 case. The court said, as can be seen, this iteration of Rule 111, unlike its predecessor, no longer includes independent civil actions under 32, 33, 34, and 2176 of the Civil Code as requiring prior reservation to be made in a previously instituted criminal action. Um, so that would be culpa aquiliana as distinguished from that of culpa criminal. And then um, we would recall having also encountered fault or negligence in the context of obligations and contracts. And so it's best to um, ask ourselves, how would we look at the culpa or the negligence or the fault that is in culpa contractual from the negligence or the fault that is in culpa aquiliana? Um, in, a 20, in a 1918 case, the Supreme Court said, um, there's a distinction between culpa contractual, between the culpa that you find in culpa contractual and the culpa or negligence or fault that we find in culpa aquiliana. The court said, um, in culpa contractual, the negligence is in the performance of contractual obligation. In culpa aquiliana, the negligence is considered as an independent source of obligation. In fact, in culpa aquiliana, um, the culpa there is substantive and independent. But in culpa contractual, the culpa there is but an incident in the performance of the obligation. So in a 2017 case of Orient, uh, Orient Freight International Incorporated, the Supreme Court said, because um, culpa aquiliana and culpa contractual are different, um, actions based on contractual negligence and actions based on quasi-delic differ in terms of conditions, defenses, and proof. So they generally cannot coexist. So I think that we need to remember the case of Kalalas versus Court of Appeals, because there's just one case that was filed there for damages, but that case was a case for culpa contractual as well as culpa aquiliana. It was um, a case where a college uh, freshman um, in Siliman took a passenger jeepney owned and operated by Kalalas. So uh, there's this contractual aspect. That jeepney was filled to capacity. And in fact, uh, Sunga was given by the conductor an extension seat. Now, on the way to Sibulan, the jeepney stopped and Sunga uh, to let a passenger off. So because she was seated on the extension seat, uh, she had to go down. Just as she was doing so, this truck driven by Verena and owned by Salva bumped the left rear portion of the jeepney. As a result, Sunga was injured. So she filed a complaint for damages and she filed a complaint for damages against two separate personalities. There's Kalalas for contract, breach of contract of carriage. And then there is also uh, Salva and Verena for, for, uh, for quasi Delhi. Um, as we can see, that is still consistent very much with the ruling of the court that they cannot coexist because the case for culpa contractual was not against one and the same person with the one who was sued also for culpa aquiliana. It's just that it's one and in the same case, but against different uh, defendants. Um, having looked at culpa aquiliana or quasi-delic as distinguished from culpa criminal and culpa contractual, um, Let's also ask ourselves, can there still be a tort even if there is a contract, an, an existing contract? Um, 2176 would seem to tell us that there can be no quasi-delic if there is a contractual relation between parties. Um, 2176 of the Civil Code reads, the fault or negligence, if there is no pre-existing contractual relation between parties, shall be called quasi-delic. Um, this has to be so because if there is an existing contract between parties, that would be the governing law between them. It would then not be Article 2176. So this is the context why I think the um, framers of our code said 
there can only be quasi-delic if there is no pre-existing contractual relation between parties. And then we have Air France versus Carascuso, and then the case, for instance, of Rehino versus Pangasinan Colleges, and the one that I will show you uh, very shortly, where the Supreme Court said, there can in fact be occasions where tort may still exist, even if there is a contract, if the act that breaks the contract can in itself be a tort. So in a 2019 case of uh, Dalen versus uh, Mitsoy OSK lines, the Supreme Court ruled that quasi-delic exists even if the parties were covered with employment contract. There, the court found that there was negligence on the part of the employer when it allowed the vessel to load and transport wet cargo resulting in the sinking of the vessel. So notwithstanding the employment or the contractual relation between parties, the act of the employer was quasi-delic and not simply a breach of contract. So that's a 2019 case. Um, so just a very brief recap, we've said uh, torts is common law in concept and therefore it covers all wrongful acts, intentional or negligent, whereas quasi-delic is civil law and so under Article 2176 can only cover negligent act. Um, just to complete the picture on this introductory concept, uh, is, we ask the question, is tort broader than quasi-delic? And the answer was provided in 1993 in the case of Shukat Baksh versus Court of Appeals, one of the favorite cases of my students. <laughs> um, breach of promise to marry case. There the Supreme Court said, quasi-delic is a civil law concept, while torts is an Anglo-American or common law concept. So in that sense then, torts is much broader than culpa aquiliana because it includes not only negligence, but intentional criminal acts like assault, battery, false imprisonment, and deceit. So when we compare tort with quasi-delic, we can really say that tort is broad, torts would be broader than quasi-delic. But when we look at the whole spectrum of Philippine legal system, um, the Supreme Court seems to be directing us to the fact that um, looking at the civil code, as well as the other aspects of revised penal code, one would think that especially we have Article 21 of the Civil Code, this seems to fill the vacuum. And so now even uh, those that are not wrong civil, um, legally can be also considered a source of damages if, if there has been breach in morals, customs, and other uh, civil wrongs that may be established. So there the court said, because we have Articles 19, 20 of the Civil Code, Article 21 specifically has greatly broadened the scope of our law on civil wrongs. And so when compared, when torts would be compared with our system of civil wrongs, um, court was bold enough to declare that in fact we have much, we have become much more supple and adaptable than the Anglo-American law on torts. Um, so since um, we've been directed actually um, by the Legal Education Board Memorandum Order Number 1 um, prescribing model curriculum to study torts and damages looking, at, looking closely at quasi-delic, let's have a look at quasi-delic. And here the main provision to be reckoned with is Article 2176 of the Civil Code. And from what we've read already, um, we've seen that it is founded on fault or negligence. So a study of quasi-delic would have to be a study of negligence in its, um, in its core. We will therefore look at the concept, the tests of negligence, the burden of proof, the presumptions of negligence. We'll look at res ipsa locator's place as a rule of evidence and then see what defenses we can set up in an action based on negligence. 2178, in trying to define negligence, um, tells us we need to look at Articles 1172 to 1174 of the Civil Code. And 1173 of the Civil Code reads, negligence consists in the omission of that diligence required by the nature of the obligation and corresponds with the circumstances of the persons of the time and of the place. From here, we can already see that the concept of negligence being omission of diligence is essentially um, 
subjective case to case to case um, um, in approach. So for instance, we need therefore to see what tests can we apply in order that we will know if negligence is present. Um, 1174 tells us to look at the aspects um, pertaining to a person's uh, nature of the obligation, assumption of risk, or even stipulations. But the old, old case of Pickard versus Smith, a 1918 case, continues to be our um, northern star if we want to know whether a person is negligent. Um, just, just a reminder, this was a case of a person who was riding a pony and who saw um, a car at that time, he described it as an apparition. And so when the car continued to move forward, the pony was frightened. So he was thrown off the pony that he was riding. And, and so he sued the owner of the car and said, um, you continuing to approach me is in fact a negligent act. The court uh, there held, um, how do we know if a person is negligent? And it uh, takes us to the test of negligence and asks us to ask the question, if we want to know if a person is negligent, ask the question of could a prudent man in the case under consideration foresee the harm? And having foreseen the harm, did he fail to take the necessary precautions? So in testing negligence, it always is a question of foreseeability of harm and the failure to take the needed precautions. Um, the foreseeability of the harm in itself is something that varies depending on the circumstances of person, time, and place, as well as the needed precautions that had to be taken. So there are so many decisions of the court that approach the aspect of whether a person has uh, taken the necessary precaution in the context of his own person, place, and time. So for instance, a different degree of diligence is required for banks. Um, a different degree of diligence is required to be observed if you are dealing with minors and is as, as illustrated in the case of Ilardi versus Aquino. A different degree of diligence is required if you are a gun owner as in the case of Passes versus Morales. Um, there's one uh, um, uh, special case, if I may say, that um, dealt with what would be the degree of diligence you would require um, for someone who is suffering from physical handicap or infirmity. And that would be the case of Francisco versus chemical uh, book carrier. In this case, the Supreme Court said, Francisco here is blind. And, and he said, he actually is asking the court to look and consider his physical infirmity in, in determining whether he should be held liable for damages. The court said to determine diligence, which has been required of all persons, the basis has always been the abstract average standard corresponding to a normal orderly person. But if one is physically disabled, uh, he is required to use that standard of care um, appertaining to one who has physical handicap and infirmity. So the court said physical handicaps and infirmities such as blindness or deafness are treated as part of the circumstances under which a reasonable person must act. And so a standard of conduct for blind person becomes that of a reasonable person who is blind. So here, the court, however, did not uh, excuse Francisco because Francisco, despite being blind, had been managing and operating the station for 15 years. And so his being blind was not a hindrance for him to transact business at this time. There's a re uh, fairly recent case of Manila Electric versus Nordic Philippines, which highlighted uh, the varying degree of standard of care and diligence you would require on the basis of one's um, the circumstance. So here, for instance, the Supreme Court said a, a, a company that's operating a business imbued with public interest is held up to a different kind of standard, a higher degree of care. The court said, the rigid doctrine states public utility has the imperative duty to make reasonable and proper inspection of its apparatus and equipment to ensure that they do not malfunction. 
and the court highlighted the fact that um, public utility distribution utilities are public utilities vested with public interest and so are held to a higher degree of diligence. So that's the concept of negligence, to be the omission of diligence um, required by the circumstances of one's person, time, and place. And then let's look at how we can prove uh, negligence. Of course, we go by the general rule as announced in many cases, one of which is BJDC construction, that one who alleges negligence has the burden of proving the same. But there are actually presumptions of negligence that the law has put in. Um, I'm, I'm speaking of, for instance, Article 2184, Article 2185, and Article 2188 of the Civil Code. Here, for instance, there is a disputable presumption of negligence that a, if the driver has been found guilty of reckless driving or violating traffic regulations at least twice within the next preceding two months. There too is a presumption of negligence if a person driving a motor vehicle has been negligent at the time of the mishap um, or that he was violating a traffic regulation rather at the time of the mishap. Um, 2185 had been the subject of a case and that's the case of Anonuevo versus the Court of Appeals decided by the court in Supreme Court in 2004. Here, um, what was involved in the in the in the case was that of a bicycle rider and that of a, the owner of a car. Um, the owner of the car sustained, uh, or rather, argued that the bicycle driver rider was um, the bicycle rider was violating traffic regulation when his bicycle bicycle was not equipped with um, reflectorized device, which was required in a city ordinance. Um, in their locality. The court said um, it is erroneous to rely on 2185 to impute presumption of negligence because 2185 cannot apply to non-motorized vehicles, even by analogy, because there's a um, substantial distinction between motor vehicle and non-motorized vehicle that the framers of the civil code were very much aware of. So they said, it must, the court said there must be a reason why 2185 presumption of negligence is limited to motorized vehicle cases. So the presumption of negligence cannot be used in non-motorized vehicles because um, there is a factual and legal basis that necessitates the distinction under Article 2185. So while general rule is that it is the burden of the party claiming negligence to prove negligence, there are presumptions that, of negligence that can be used. And then there is such a thing as res ipsa locutor. The court made it clear that this isn't a presumption of negligence. This is instead a rule of evidence. Um, I think one of the very first few cases that uh, mentioned res ipsa lucitor would be Africa versus Caltex. A conflagration um, happened. Um, nobody was able to trace the, the source, the proximate causation of that uh, conflagration. And um, the court, however, said, if we ask the question of if the accident is a kind which does not necessarily or ordinarily occur unless someone is negligent and the cause of that injury was under the exclusive control of the person in charge, then the person, the injury suffered must not have been due to any voluntary action or contribution on the part of the person injured. Then um, there can be an application of res ipsa locutor. So, in the case of Perla Compania de Seguros versus Sarangaya, the Supreme in 2005, the Supreme Court said, we then use res ipsa locutor if, there, if by the nature of the incident, direct evidence is not available. So if the nature of the incident is such that direct evidence is not available, the plaintiff can rely on uh, the fact that the accident happened and that um, it is within the exclusive control of the defendant. And then if that is the case, there is then the, 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 the rule of evidence will set in that the person who has the exclusive control of the instrumentality that caused the thing from happening is in fact negligent. Um, in 1988 case of La Yugan, the Supreme Court cautioned, 
you can't just brandish uh, res ipsa lucitor each time you can't find proof of negligence because the doctrine can only apply if the if the nature of the case is such that no direct evidence is available um, so i think that that is one thing uh, that we need to keep in mind but um, proving negligence is but part of the equation if we look at article 2179 of the civil code it says when plaintiff's own negligence was the immediate and proximate cause of the injury he cannot recover damages so it means that the negligence in itself must be the proximate cause of the incident otherwise even if negligence is proven if that negligence, however, is not the proximate cause, then there still can be no recovery. That is the import of the Supreme Court's ruling in many cases, among which is sanitary steam laundry versus the Court of Appeals. In this case, um, there, was, there was presumption of negligence that was invoked because there was a traffic violation that was committed. And because, uh, because the presumption was invoked and it falls squarely within the circumstance, negligence was in fact established. But the court said, even if there was negligence on the part of the owner of the Cimarron, um, this incident would still have happened despite the, despite the application of the, uh, despite the fact that he applied, he could not stop despite the fact that he applied the brakes. And there the court said, it's not enough, therefore, to establish negligence. It is equally important that that negligence was, in fact, the uh, proximate cause of the happening of the event. So that negligence is without legal consequence unless it is established to be the proximate cause of the injury. So to, to enable a person, a, a plaintiff to recover, he must be able to establish negligence, whether by direct evidence or by the use of presumptions of negligence or the invocation of the rule of evidence of res ipsa locator. But he must also establish that that negligence is in fact the proximate cause of the incident. And um, so we need to have a look at the meaning of proximate cause. Um, to be that which setting uh, in the natural and continuous sequence and broken by any efficient intervening cause and without which the result would not have occurred. So from this definition of proximate cause, um, we know that there can be such a thing as immediate cause, intervening cause, remote cause. Now, the immediate cause need not necessarily be the proximate cause. And we know this to be illustrated by A bumping into the car of B um, because A was bumped, uh, A's car was bumped by C. Um, actually, uh, the damage on the car of B was because C bumped into the car of A, which then caused uh, A to bump into the car of B. Um, so when we are able to establish a case for quasi delic by showing negligence that is the proximate cause of the incident, uh, the next thing we need to look at would be what defenses can possibly be set up. Uh, of course, 2176 would tell us um, that the first defense you can actually set up is that my negligence is not the proximate cause. So proximate causation would be one defense. The other defense that can be set up is that there was an assumption of risk. Assumption of risk as a principle was first announced, I think, in the case of Akialda versus Husoli, decided in 1949. This was a case of a caretaker of Carabao who was gored to death by the Carabao he was taking care of. So when the heirs filed a case against the owner of the Carabao, the Supreme Court held that the animal, in fact, was in the custody and under the control of the caretaker who was paid uh, for his work as such. So it was the caretaker's business to try to prevent the animal from causing injury. And being injured by the animal under that circumstance was one of the risks of the occupation. Mm -hmm. In the in, uh, foreign jurisprudence would point us also to the risk that is being taken by um, the boxers uh, or even by the athletes to be an aspect of assumption of risk. 
1989, Ilocos Norte versus the Court of Appeals said, you can't uh, invoke the doctrine of assumption of risk. If the person is responding to an emergency or if the life or property of another is in peril. So it has been held that a person is excused from the force of the rule of assumption of risk when he voluntarily assents to a known danger because there was an emergency that was found to exist or if he is responding to the life or property of another that is in peril. The bar question that was asked in 2012 was about also assumption of risk. And it is in fact, um, the, back, the backdrop of that is in fact taken from the case of Nico Hotel Manila Garden versus Reyes. Um, here, Amay Bisaya went or gate crashed and an exclusive party and he was asked to leave. One of the arguments that was presented uh, to ward off liability when Amay Bisaya filed a case for damages was that a gate crusher actually assumes the risk of being asked to leave. And the court said, um, or the court rather, defined for us what is meant by assumption of risk. And it tells us that it is that self-inflicted injury or a consent to injury, which then precludes recovery of damages by one who has knowingly and voluntarily exposed himself to danger, even if he is not negligent in doing so. The other defense that can be set up and which was mentioned in the coverage of the uh, bar exam for 2020-2021 in civil law is this doctrine of last clear chance. Um, this doctrine goes by other names also, such as this doctrine of supervening negligence, doctrine of discovered peril, and then it was even called also humanitarian doctrine in some literatures. So what is this doctrine of last clear chance? you'd actually have here two acts of negligence occurring. But the, the negligence of plaintiff was prior or antecedent to the negligence of the defendant. And in the end, it is the defendant who had the last clear chance to avoid the impending harm and failed to do so. So that notwithstanding the prior negligence of plaintiff, there can still be recovery against uh, the defendant who had the last clear chance to avoid the impending harm from happening. The old case of Picard versus Smith was actually most instructive about um, doctrine of last clear chance. Here, uh, there were two acts of negligence occurring, but the act of negligence of plaintiff was antecedent to the negligence of the defendant. And the court disregarded then the negligence of the plaintiff so as to allow complete or full recovery. Here's what the court said in 1918. Plaintiff was not free from fault. He was negligent. But his negligence was antecedent to the negligence of the defendant who was also negligent. So the negligent acts of two parties were not contemporaneous. The negligence of the defendant succeeded the negligence of the plaintiff by an appreciable interval of time. And because the negligence of plaintiff was antecedent to the negligence of the defendant, there can be full recovery without reference to the prior negligence of the plaintiff. Which brings us to the issue of, then there's the aspect of contributory negligence. Um, 2179 of the Civil Code says, if the negligence was contributory and the immediate and proximate cause of the injury being the defendant's lack of care, the plaintiff may recover damages, but the court shall mitigate the damages to be awarded. How do we distinguish the negligence we find in last clear chance doctrine from the negligence that is also present in the doctrine, uh, in the doctrine of contributory negligence? Now, under the last clear chance doctrine, the negligence there of plaintiff and the negligence of the defendant are not concurring. The negligence of plaintiff is antecedent to the negligence of the defendant. But when we invoke the doctrine of contributory negligence, the picture that we should have in mind is that the negligence of the two parties are concurring. And because they are concurring, uh, plaintiff reco plaintiff's recovery will have to be mitigated. 
And in that sense, therefore, unlike the doctrine of last clear chance, which is a complete defense for the negligence of plaintiff, the doctrine of contributory negligence is but a partial defense by plaintiff for his own negligence. We see its illustration in the 2015 case of National Transmission Corporation versus De Jesus. Here, De Jesus was found to be negligent in not using protective equipment. And because his negligence was concurring, um, the court said that act was an act of negligence contributory to the unfortunate incident that led to his death. Accordingly, the amount of damages that can be recovered by his heirs was reduced by 20%. There's a nice twist to this doctrine of contributory negligence, and that's the case of uh, Jarco Marketing versus the Court of Appeals, decided by the court in 1999. Here, um, the supermarket had the heart to say that uh, uh, the child who eventually died um, had a contributory, uh, can be accused of contributory negligence when she hurled herself on top of, uh, on top of the countertop, uh, which gave in and which eventually led to her death. There the court said, in our jurisdiction, a person under nine is conclusively presumed to have acted without discernment. Um, the same presumption and like exemption from criminal liability obtains in a case of person over nine under 15, unless it is shown that he has acted with discernment. So taking that as a context, the court said, if a child under nine years old can be conclusively presumed to have acted without discernment, it can also be said that a child under nine years of age can be conclusively presumed to be incapable of contributory negligence as a matter of law. The other defense that can be set up is this emergency rule. This was also mentioned in the syllabus released by Justice Leonin. Um, and what is emergency rule? Um, among the cases that um, expounded on this concept would be Valenzuela versus the Court of Appeals in 1996. Um, there the court said, when an individual who suddenly finds himself in a situation of danger and is required to act without much time to consider the best means that may be adopted to avoid the impending danger, he cannot be held guilty of negligence. If he fails to undertake what may on hindsight or what subsequently and upon reflection may appear to be a better solution. The only caveat is that the emergency must not be brought about by his own negligence. The other defense that can be set up is prescription. And here there's an important, important case that we need to highlight, which changed uh, the ruling of the court um, on prescription, uh, um, first announced in the case of vector uh, shipping. Um, Justice Bernabe released a 2019, uh, penned a 2019 case that changed the rules concerning uh, sub, uh, prescription in a, in a case for subrogation. But first, let's look at Article 1146. It says here, an action for quasi delic must be instituted uh, within four years from occurrence of the cause. Let me just also then uh, take us to this case governing uh, subrogation. First, as a background, in 2013, Supreme Court uh, decided this case of Vector Shipping Corporation versus American Home Assurance Company. Um, briefly, Caltex transported petroleum cargoes through MV Vector. Caltex uh, insured the cargo with American Home Assurance Company. Um, MV Vector and MV Pass collided on December 20. Let me just get the dates because they are extremely important to um, look at the issue of prescription. Uh, MV Vector and MV Pass collided on December 20, 1987. And the entire petroleum cargo of uh, Caltex perished. 
So December 20, 1987 um, was the date of the collision. July 12, 1988, a year after, less than a year after, American Home Assurance indemnified Caltex. And on March 5, 1992, American Home Assurance sued Vector, among others. So the argument that was raised by Vector was that your case is already prescribed. The collision occurred in 1987. You paid uh, uh, Caltex in 1988. You filed the case in 1992. If we look at uh, the provision of the civil code on prescription, we only have four years from occurrence of cause. And so if the collision occurred in 1987 plus four, 1991. And because the case was only filed in March 5, 1992, prescription was set up as a defense. The court said, um, the cause of action of American Home Assurance Company did not yet prescribe. The legal provision governing this case is not 1146 of the Civil Code, but 1144. And 1144 of the Civil Code states, actions that must be brought within 10 years from the time of, the cause, from, from the time of occurrence of the cause would be among others, number two, upon an obligation created by law. And the court said in Vector Shipping Corporation that subrogation is one obligation created or arising from law. So the applicable provision would be 1144 and announced then that the period of limitation is 10 years. Then came the case of Henson versus UCTB General Insurance Company. This is an unbanked decision of the court decided in August 14, 2019. The court looked at the aspect of legal subrogation and held that if we look at Article 1303 of the Civil Code, subrogation is but a mode of creditor substitution. And so because legal substitution is but a mode of creditor substitution, the insurer can take nothing by subrogation but the rights of the insured. And so based on that premise, the court said, we must therefore abandon the ruling in vector that an insurer may file an action against the tort fees or 10 years from the time the insurer indemnifies the insured. Following the principles of subrogation, the insurer only steps into the shoes of the insured and therefore for purposes of prescription inherits only the remaining period within which the insured may file an action against the wrongdoer. The prescriptive period of the action that the insured may file against the wrongdoer begins at the time that the tort was committed and the loss or injury occurred against the insured. So this led the court to issue several, uh, to issue guidelines vis-a-vis the prescriptive period in cases where the insurer is subrogated to the rights of the insured against the wrongdoer based on quasi-delict. The court said, there are several scenarios. The first is, the cases that were filed by the insurer during the applicability of vector ruling, that is to say, from August 15, 2013, until the finality of the Henson decision of the Supreme Court in 2019, the prescriptive period is 10 years from the time of payment by the insurer to the insured, because the vector do doctrine was the prevailing rule at this time. And so issues of prescription must be resolved under vector's parameters. But for cases that were filed by the insurer prior to the applicability of the vector ruling, that is to say, before August 15, 2013, the prescriptive period is four years from the time the tort was committed. This is because the, doctr the vector doctrine, which espoused a unique rule on legal subrogation, was not yet a binding precedent at that time. For cases, however, that had not yet been filed at the time of the finality of the decision of the court in 2019, 
the court held. Where the tort was committed and the subsequent loss or injury against the insured occurred prior to the finality of the decision of the court in 2019, the insurer is given a period not exceeding four years from the time of finality of the decision in Henson to file the action against the wrongdoer, provided it does not exceed the total period of 10 years. But for cases where the tort was committed after the vector ruling was uh, overruled by the, uh, overturned by the Supreme Court, in other words, after the finality of the Henson ruling, the vector doctrine would no longer hold application. And the rule will be that. The prescriptive period is four years from the time the tort is committed against the insured by the wrongdoer. So this one's a landmark case. It's an unbank ruling of the court, and that's the case of Henson Jr. versus UCPB General Insurance Company, um, which made the court re-examine uh, the vector doctrine. And so the rule now is that um, the prescriptive period of an action that the insured can file against the wrongdoer begins at the time that the tort was committed, and it is not any more 10 years, but four years from occurrence of the cause. For those of us studying civil procedure, actions for damages caused by a tortious conduct of the defendant survive the death of the latter. So we've looked at the concept of negligence, how to go about proving negligence. We've also looked at having established negligence, what defenses can be set up. Um, it's time we look at who can be held liable uh, for torts. There are actually um, three articles, but they are, uh, but the, import effect and implications are so wide, uh, are, are, are far reaching. First, we look at 2176 and it says, whoever causes damage to another, there being fault or negligence is obliged to pay for the damage done. But if there are several tort feasors, the liability for quasi-delic shall be solidary. And then there is 2180. And 2180 is what is otherwise known as the doctrine of vicarious or imputed liability. It says the obligation imposed by Article 2176 of the Civil Code is demandable not only for one's own acts or omissions, but also for those of persons for whom one is responsible. Um, in the class, we'd, we'd ask our students to read and reread Article 2180. In the light or in the context of this principle in civil law, our system of redress had always been founded on the fact that you can only be held responsible for your own act or omission. But when you find Article 2180 and it says, uh, the obligation is demandable not only for one's own acts or omissions, but also for those of persons for whom one is responsible. The question um, that would right away be posed is, are we creating a liability for a separate set of persons, uh, for a separate set of persons uh, who are responsible not for their own acts or omissions, but for the acts of persons who are under their care? Um, that is very important because it would then lead us into the discussion of if you have a person committing an act or omission, and this person is under the supervision of another, can I file a case against the person supervising him without having to implead the very person who committed the act or omission? In Kanko, a 1918 case, the Supreme Court said, the legislature which adopted our civil code um, has always uh, founded uh, the reason or the cost for award of damages on the fact that you shall be held responsible for or culpability can only be directly imputed to the person who caused the act or omission. And so which brings us to the aspect of what is the basis of liability of 2180? 
actually, if we look at uh, 2180 itself, the person for whom one is responsible has committed an act or omission, which led us to question ourselves. Why has he committed that act or omission? It must be because we have been remiss in having to supervise him. And that is, in fact, the context by which 2180 is founded. The basis, therefore, of liability of the persons enumerated in Article 2180 would be his own negligent act of failing to supervise the person who is under his care or supervision. And that is the context by which Cerezo versus Toison was decided by the court in, 20, in 2004. In Cerezo versus Toison, there is a driver and the owner of the vehicle. A case was filed against the owner of the vehicle without impleding the driver who cannot be found at that time. The defendant lawyer asked for the dismissal of the case on the ground that um, the plaintiff then was not able to implead, despite order from the court, was not able to implead the driver. And the court there um, ask in fact the plaintiff to implead the driver on the assumption or on the contention that the driver here is an indispensable party to the civil action for damages. The Supreme Court held there is the person who committed the act or omission and then there is a pers the person who is um, having him as uh, who is supervising him and the court ruled vicarious liability is a liability that is primary and direct. What is being punished is the person's act or omission in failing to supervise that uh, person who is under his care. So because it is his primary and direct liability, you need not even bring in the person for whose acts or omissions he is made answerable. So as held by the court, it is not vicarious liability is not subsidiary to the liability of the person for whom one is made vicariously liable of. Although the negligence is simply imputed in the sense that it arises from the act or omission of the person under one's care or control, the act being punished is the negligent act of the one made vicariously liable. So you can proceed against the uh, person supervising another together with the driver, for instance, in this case of Cerizo, or you can proceed against the employer without having to impede the driver. So let's have a look at the persons who are made uh, vicariously liable. Uh, the first in the list would be parents. The, the wording in 2180 of the civil code had been that. Uh, who can be held vicariously liable for acts or omissions of their minor children who live in their company, uh, the father, and only in the case of death or incapacity will the mother be held responsible for the damages caused by the minor children who live in their company. Father Onta. But um, the family code um, was passed in Article 221 of the family code made parents liable for the acts of their children who live in their company. So now parents, not just father, uh, would be held liable for acts or omissions of the minor children living in their company. Um, so two things must concur for parents to be held liable. Um, the act or omission must be done by, the, by their minor children living in their company. And here, we may need to have a look at RA 6809. Uh, the relevant provision in RA 6809 reads, majority commences at the age of 18, but nothing in this code shall be construed to derogate from the duty or responsibility of parents and guardians for children below 21 years of age mentioned in second and third paragraphs of article 2180. So that, for purposes of ascribing vicarious liability of parents, the age of majority would not be 18 um, that will be reckoned with. Because even if we have lowered the age of majority to 18, the law made specific provision that this shall not derogate from the duty or responsibility of parents and guardians for children living with them below 21 years of age. In fact, there has been a criticism that the moment you turn 18, uh, there's 
uh, parental emancipation, emancipation from parental responsibility. And uh, however, because of the reservation that was made by the law, uh, parents remain responsible for your act or omission until you reach the age of 21. So between 18 and 21 would be the age of parental uh, liability, even if there is no more parental responsibility in view of the uh, child's emancipation. So in the case, for instance, of uh, parents, the minor child to be read in the context of below 21 must be living in the company of their parents so that parents will be held vicariously liable. This uh, flows from the legal and natural duty of the parents to closely supervise the child who is in their custody and control. This was asked in 2010 bar. And look, the, look at the hefty points assigned by the bar examiner um, on this uh, question or topic. Six, total of six points. In 2010, this was asked. 1989, 16-year-old Rosano was issued a student permit, drove, a school, drove to school a car, which was a gift from his parents. His class was scheduled to go on field trip. His teacher requested him to accommodate uh, in his car four of his classmates. On the way to museum, which the students were scheduled to visit, Rosano made a wrong maneuver, causing a collision with Jeepney tragic, one of his classmates died. Uh, he and three others were badly injured. And the question that was asked is, who is liable for the death of Rosano's classmate and the injury suffered by Rosano and his three other classmates? 2%. What about the damage to the jeepney? 2%. And under the same set of facts, what, um, except that the date of occurrence was in mid-94, what would be the answer? I think this, this is really just asking us to be keenly aware that uh, the provision of 2180 will apply to children living in the company of their parents until they reach the age of 21. Now, if the basis of liability is that the parents actually would have the... Uh, duty and legal and moral duty to closely supervise their children who, is, who are under their custody. The same uh, reasoning can be used for minor children that, is, that are up for adoption. In the case of Tamargo versus the Court of Appeals, a question that was asked, between the adopting parent and the natural biological uh, parent who should be held liable for an act or omission committed by the minor child sought to be adopted and the court settled the matter not by choosing one over the other because one is a biological parent or the other is already the adopting parent. The court looked at who had actual custody during the time of the incident. And there the court said the trial custody period had not yet begun. And so the, the actual custody was still with the natural parents, not the adopting parents. And so the ones who will be held liable will be the natural parents and not the adopting parents because the actual custody at the time of the incident was still with them. Um, guardians are also held uh, li vicariously liable for acts or omissions of the minors under their care. Um, one very important aspect of vicarious liability is vicarious liability of employers. And here we just have to correlate this with different kinds of employers. Employers in the context of a culpa contractual case, employers in the context of a culpa aquiliana case, employers in the context of a culpa criminal, uh, in, a, in a criminal case, not necessarily culpa uh, criminal. So let's first have a look at uh, the liability of employers in a case for quasi deli in a, uh, under the civil code, under 2180. 2180, paragraphs 4 and 5, contemplates of two kinds of employers. Um, employers engaged in business, employers not engaged in business. Um, employers engaged in business, they are responsible for acts of their employees in the service of the branches in which the latter are employed or on the occasion of their functions. Employers not engaged in business are responsible for acts of their employees acting within the scope of their assigned task. So which led us to ask, when can it be said that the employee 
was acting on the uh, within the scope of his assigned task or on the occasion of the performance of the employee's function. Castelex is a really interesting case. Um, this was decided in 1999, and there the court uh, looked at um, the scenario where an employee was issued a company vehicle and something happened. Uh, can it be said that the operation of employer-issued motor vehicle by the employee um, is sufficient to trigger uh, the vicarious liability of the employer? And, and the court made this distinction. If the employee uses the employer issued vehicle in going to and from his workplace. Um, he is not acting within the scope of his assigned task in the absence of special business benefit to the employer. If the employee is using the company issued vehicle in going to and from his workplace, um, there would be also no special, uh, there will be no, uh, it cannot be said that the employer is acting within the scope of his assigned task in the absence of a showing of a special benefit of, of the, uh, to the employee, to the employer. This is because uh, taking your meals, going to and from your workplace are, are personal problems or concerns of the employee. And unless we're able to show special benefit to the employer, the use of company issued vehicle by the employee cannot be said to be an occasion whereby he is acting within the scope of his assigned task. So we cannot trigger the vicarious liability of the employer. Um, in 2018, the Supreme Court actually held that an act is deemed an assigned task if it is done by the employee in furtherance of the interests of the employer or for the account of the employer at the time of the infliction of injury or damage. Now, let's just very quickly remember that there's a mention of employer's liability in the revised penal code. 103 of RPC uh, says, employers shall be held subsidiarily liable for felonies committed by their employees in the discharge of the latter's duties. <clears throat> four, uh, four. Three conditions must have to be present as enumerated in Basa Marketing versus uh, Bulinao decided by the court uh, and uh, where it was held. For the employer to be subsidiarily liable for employees civil liability in the criminal case it must be shown that the employer is engaged in some kind of industry that the employee committed the offense in the discharge of his duties and that the employee is insolvent so that the scenario is there's a criminal case filed against the employee so this is people versus employee and that criminal case uh, culminated in the employee having been civilly adjudged liable. Now, the employee was insolvent. And it has been shown that the employer is engaged in some kind of industry and that the employee committed the offense in the discharge of his duties. What may then be done is to file a motion to have the employer uh, subsidiarily liable for the civil liability of the employee that had been found to be insolvent. So that the liability of the employer under the, civil, uh, under the revised penal code will come in only after the employee had been uh, convicted and held civilly liable ex delicto. It has been shown that he committed the act in the discharge of his duties and that the employee was insolvent. Precisely the reason why the liability is subsidiary. It comes in only when all of these uh, factors are shown to have existed. Which was the reason why Supreme Court pointed out in the case of Dr. Solidum versus People, decided in 2014, that there is a flaw in logic and in law when the regional trial court of, uh, of R, uh, when the RTC of Manila held the employer hospital liable together with Dr. Solidum in the dispositive portion of the decision of the RTC convicting uh, Dr. Solidum, there was a mention that 
Hospital ng Maynila is held jointly and severally, meaning to say solidarily liable with Dr. Solidum for damages. But the court held um, this is flawed because Hospital ng Maynila had not even been impleted as a one of the uh, accused in the criminal case can even implead also Hospital ng Maynila. And that the court therefore said um, there is no way that uh, Hospital ng Maynila could be held civilly liable under Article 103 because the civil liability will come in under Article 103 if and only if it has been shown that the conditions for subsidiary liability are present. So to hold therefore an employer liable for the acts or um, uh, of for the offense for the damage done rather by the employer and employee under the revised penal code it must be shown that the employer is engaged in some kind of business the offense was committed by the employee in the discharge of his function and the employee was insolvent if these conditions are present the court held in carpio versus doroha that the liability uh, Epso facto exists. So there can be no other defenses that can be raised by the employer. The subsidiary liability immediately attaches upon the showing of these conditions. When all of these requisites are present, employer becomes epso facto subsidiarily liable upon the employee's conviction and upon proof of the latter's insolvency. Um, if we look at, uh, so what would then be the defense of an employer if he is being made subsidiarily liable under Article 103 of the RPC? He just has to show that none or none of these conditions exist, meaning to say he is not engaged in some kind of business, the offense was not committed in the discharge of the employee's functions, or the employee was not insolvent. If the conditions, however, are present, he does not have any defense that he can set up. In sharp contrast, we look at employer's liability under Article 2180 of the Civil Code, and we know that the liability here is not subsidiary. The reason why employers are vicariously liable under Article 2180 is because they were negligent. It is their own negligence that is being punished in failing to supervise their employees. And so the liability in Article 2180 of the employer is direct and immediate. So it is not conditioned upon prior recourse against the negligent employee or even upon a prior showing of insolvency. The employer's defense is the, the exercise of the observance of the diligence of the good father of family. And here very quickly, there had been many cases decided by the court detailing what is meant by diligence of good father of family. Um, consists of two parts, diligence in the selection and in the supervision of employees. On the matter of selection, he must have to scrutinize the employee's qualifications, experience, and service records. And so it's very expensive not to apply for a job because they require you all sorts of clearances to be obtained before you can even be hired. But that has to be so because that is proof of the exercise of due diligence in the selection of the employee, especially that the Supreme Court has held that the in the selection, due diligence in the selection of employee, the facts must be shown by concrete proof, including documentary evidence. So in the matter of due diligence in the supervision of employee. In other words, it's not sufficient for the employer to show that he was very careful in selecting the employee. He must as well show that after having taken in the employee, he exercised due diligence in the supervision of the employee. And on the matter of supervision, employer should formulate standard operating procedure, monitor the implementation, and even impose disciplinary sanctions. And take note of the requirement of the court that this must be shown by concrete proof, including documentary evidence, which is why it is always the advice of our students um, to the to the um, to employ uh, prospective employers to always have manual of uh, manual of instructions concerning uh, or rather formulating standard operating procedures, memos that would show that the uh, SOPs had been implemented and even disciplinary measures had been imposed for breaches thereof.
Then there's an employer in the context of culpa contractual case. Um, for instance, you have a common career and uh, there was a breach of contract of carriage. Article 1759 of the Civil Code mentions that common careers are liable for the death or injuries to passengers, although that employee may have acted beyond the scope of their authority or in violation of the order of common career. And so if we look at 1759, if you were an employer facing a civil case for breach of contract of carriage, it's no defense that the employee was not acting within the scope of his assigned task. It's no defense that you've exercised all the diligence of good father of family because 1759 says liability will still be affixed on common career even if the employee may have acted beyond the scope of their authority or in violation of the orders of the common career. Um, there is need, therefore, to have at your fingertips uh, these various hats that an employer can wear. There is a liability of the employer under Article 103 of the Revised Penal Code. There's liability of the employer under Article 1759 of the Civil Code. And then there's liability of the employer under Article 2180 of the Civil Code. Liability of the employer under Article 103 is subsidiary, subject to the defenses that the three conditions are not present. So if the three conditions are present, you don't really have any defense. In 1759, the liability of the common career employer um, attaches even if the employee has acted beyond the scope of his assigned task. And here, 1759 is very explicit. You can't even escape liability by showing that you've exercised all the diligence of good father or family in the selection and supervision of the employees. Because that kind of defense is available only to the employer who is being sued under Article 2180 of the Civil Code for Culpa Aquiliana. In fact, this has been the subject of several, several bar examination questions, if not in civil law, then also in uh, commercial law. Um, 2015, 2013, where the court had, uh, court, bar examiner had painted a scenario of culpa contractual case and what, and, and then asks the examinees to tell us what kind of defenses will be raised or can be raised. So for instance, in 2009, for a hefty 3%, the court said, here is the scenario of an employer being held liable, but this time as in a culpa contractual case, what valid defenses can be raised? And here is also an employer being held liable, UTI, under a quasi-delic scenario, what um, defense or defenses can be raised? Examinees should not be able to raise the defense of due diligence in the selection and supervision of employee if the case that uh, employer was facing is not a case for culpa aquiliana. There's a very important, um, there are several important rulings governing registered owner rule. Um, the rule had been that in 2018, the registered owner of the motor vehicle is considered the employer of the tortfeasor driver. In 2019, this one's really important. Of Spouses Mangaron versus Hana via Design and Construction, decided in September 23, 2019, the Supreme Court held, as between the registered owner and the driver, the former is considered the employer of the latter. Registered owner is the employer of the driver and is made primarily liable for the tort committed by the driver. But the real owner cannot escape liability. Under the principle of unjust enrichment, the registered owner who shouldered the liability has the right to be indemnified by means of cross-claim by the actual employer of the negligent driver. This was in 2019. Let's just uh, tie this up with the ruling of the court in 2015. The court there said, um, in our transport corporation, the registered owner of a vehicle rather than the actual owner, is to, be, is to be the one that will be held liable with subsidiary, solidarily liable with the driver. And the liability and the responsibility of the registered owner um, will attach. But if the basis of liability 
is not culpa contractual, but culpa aquiliana. The liability will have to apply to the uh, employer, the actual owner of the vehicle. And so let's just very quickly have a look at the ruling of the court in our transport. You have a case for culpa contractual, breach of contract of carriage. You have the employ you have two kinds of uh, personalities there. The registered owner who actually transferred ownership of the vehicle to another person, but he who remained to be the registered owner. So you have the registered owner and the actual owner. Um, whose liability is it for whenever the driver has, has committed a negligent act? The court said, for purposes of fixing liability, the registered owner rather than the actual owner shall be solidarily liable with the driver. But in the context of a case for quasi delic the court has ruled uh, before that. Here the court said, Tamayo is the registered owner. Since the transfer here, um, but there was already a transfer, the one who is directly responsible is still the registered owner for the death and for the accident. He will be responsible as registered owner for, uh, for the damages that had been claimed by the passengers, but the transfer shall be liable or responsible to the registered owner for what the latter may have been adjudged to pay. This is very important because if the registered owner, for instance, has paid one million, he can then go after the actual owner. And if we take the ruling of the court, he, will, he can ask the actual owner to pay him one million, the amount that he has been adjudged to pay. But then the Supreme Court ruled, if the case, however, is one not for breach of contract of carriage, but for quasi deli, the liability is solidary. The liability of both the registered owner and the actual owner shall be solidary. And this means that it is for the better protection of the public if both the owner of record and the actual owner shall be held solidarily liable. And this one's quite important. So that then, for instance, in a case not for culpa contractual, but for culpa aquiliana, you have the registered owner and the actual operator, and they are being held liable. The court has ruled that the liability is solidary. So unlike in the case of culpa contractual, where the registered owner can ask for full reimbursement from the actual operator, in a case for culpa aquiliana, the case is such that he can only ask for the uh, portion corresponding to the solidary liability of the actual operator. So if we try to read together what the Supreme Court said in our transport, as well as in Spouses Mangaron decided in 2019, it would be that the registered owner was made to pay for the acts or omissions of the driver then the registered owner can then ask for reimbursement from the, uh, from the driver, not for the full amount, but for the portion corresponding to the share of the actual operator by means of cross-claim as against that actual employer. Um, this is, I think, how we can uh, harmonize our transport as well as the case of um, spouses, Mangaron versus Hana via design and construction. Here the court said, as between the registered owner and the, uh, and the driver, the former is considered the employer. And using the principle of unjust enrichment, that registered owner shall then have the right to be indemnified by means of cross claim as against the actual employer of the negligent driver. If this were a class, I'd ask my students to convince the, uh, his or her seatmate to, as to what would be the best way of him holding the employer liable. Um, there's 2180 that said, for employers that had been made to pay uh, 
using vicarious liability principle under a case for quasi deli. He can ask uh, full reimbursement from the employee for what he has paid or delivered in satisfaction of the claim. Although in reality, um, I don't think that um, this is really very much feasible. Um, but 2180 has to be read in the light of Article 2184. Because here this contemplates of another kind of employer. If you are an employer and you were in the vehicle at the time of the mishap, you are solidarily liable with your driver if it can be shown that by the use of due diligence you could have prevented the misfortune. And because you are solidarily liable with the driver, you actually cannot uh, claim reimbursement for the full amount that you have paid. What you can ask reimbursement for would be that portion of liability of the driver. But if you were not in the vehicle at the time of the incident, uh, then Article 2180 is what will apply. And you will get paid by way of reimbursement for whatever it is that you have delivered in satisfaction of the claim. This was a bar question. In 2009, uh, this was asked for 4%. Rommel's private car, while being driven by the family driver Amado, hits a pedestrian causing the latter's death. Rommel was not in the car when the incident happened. So is Rommel liable to the heirs? Of course, using vicarious liability, yes. Would your answer be the same if Rommel was in the car? The difference would be if he was in the car and it was shown that he could not have, and he did not, with the use of due diligence, prevented the incident from happening. His liability is solidary. He cannot claim full reimbursement, which would have been the case um, if he was not in the car and he was able to prove due diligence in the selection and supervision of the employee. Um, not much time there, so we'll just skip uh, state liable if it acts through a special agent. As well, and there are so many bar questions on this one. LGUs liable um, for damage occurring on their the failure to uh, uh, for damages occurring for those streets or roads under their control or supervision. Uh, teachers are liable for acts or omissions of their students or pupils, uh, regardless of age. But school and administrators will be liable for acts or omissions of minor child under their care and supervision. Um, teachers are liable for acts or omissions of their students so long as they remain in their custody. And uh, there has really been a change in the meaning of what is being in our custody. In 1971, being in our custody would mean when the student is at attendance in school, even during recess time. But then in 1988, the Supreme Court held the student is under our care and supervision if the student is in our school premises in pursuance of a legitimate student objective in the exercise of a legitimate student right and my God, even in the enjoyment of a legitimate student privilege. So even if the student should be doing nothing more than relaxing in the campus, in the company of his classmates, he is still within the custody and subject to the discipline of the school authorities under Article 2180. So Amadora, in fact, says even if the student was not in class for as long as he was in school premises, it, it may be argued he was within the custody of the teacher. And this was even expanded in Article 218 of the Family Code when it says they are within our custody for all authorized acts transpiring within, whether inside rather or outside the premises of the school. And we're just reminded of the same CMO 17 issued by uh, CHED on field trips and educational tours. This was asked in the bar and allocated 6% in bar of 2010. And there was even a question also that was asked in its multiple choice part. So the defense, of course, of the teacher being held liable vicariously is that he exercised due diligence. And what would constitute due diligence is when he is strict in enforcing school regulations and in maintaining discipline, as was held by the court in Amadora versus Court of Appeals. I don't have much time, so I will probably just have to very quickly go into strict liability torts, special torts, and kindred torts, emphasizing on this new aspect of, 
of torts relating to data privacy we call privacy torts. Strict liability torts is such is uh, because there really is no need here to prove negligence. Um, known as liability without fault, this is branch of torts that seeks to regulate activities that are useful and necessary, but that may create abnormally dangerous risks to the society. Here, you did not have proof to prove rather negligence. And what are these special classes of special torts? Our strict, <laughs> strict liability torts. You have possessor of animals, and they are being held liable for the damage caused by their animal, even if that animal may have escaped or be lost. The justification, and this is part of risk or loss distribution, is that it is based on natural equity and on the principle of social interest that he who possesses animals for his utility, pleasure, or service must answer for the damage which such animal may cause. And in 2010 bar, for four important percent, the, Supreme, uh, the bar examiner asked this in civil law. Primo owns iguana. Iguana was able to escape and, uh, and, and chanced upon it. He panicked, tripped on something, and suffered a broken leg. Can can N make uh, who is liable for N's injury? And that is already worth 4%. Um, strict liability torts would also fall upon manufacturers and processors of foodstuff. Um, we're reminded of this case of mercury drug, where mercury drug employee dispensed Diami, uh, dormicum, a sleeping tablet, when what should have been given was diamicron. And the Supreme Court ruled the rule of caveat in tour cannot apply to the purchase and sale of drugs. Um, we're also reminded of this 2016 case where if you want to hold a manufacturer of a vehicle liable, you must be able to show that the defect was present upon delivery or manufacture of the product, and there has been no substantial change in the condition by which it was sold. Here, the court did not apply strict liability torts because what was brought was a vehicle that was a second-hand Ford, and there had already been a substantial change in the condition at the time it was sold. Special torts would be those kinds of torts relating to 21, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 32, 34, 35 of the Civil Code or the chapter on human relations. And foremost of this would be the abuse of right principle. Um, this is the one actually that broadened the spectrum of our civil redress for damages. So in 2018, the Supreme Court um, decided this particular special torts and held that the disconnection and transfer of water service connection without the consumer's knowledge and consent is considered an abuse of right by the met by uh, uh, as held in metro high subdivision homeowners association but every abuse of right claim must have to be founded on malice and bad faith so you must be able to show malice and bad faith and here it's, uh, this was an an important case of UE. Uh, educational institutions are bound to inform the students of their academic status and not wait for the latter to inquire from the former. The conscious indifference of a person to the rights or welfare of the persons who may be affected by this act can support a claim for damages. And also this case of Nico Hotel Manila Garden of a gate crasher who was asked to leave. The Supreme Court uh, made a, may, uh, decided this case on the basis of one important factual consideration. The court ruled that it was not shown that the one who asked Amai Bisaya to leave was motivated by ill will. And so the act complained of was not shown to be intentional. And yet, for Article 19, 20, 21 case uh, or abusive principle case to prosper, it must be shown that there is an act which is legal, but that is contrary to morals, good custom, public order, or public policy, and it is done with intent to injure. So the common theme that runs through 1921 or your abusive right principle would be the intent to injure, that the act complained of must be intentional. Um, there's medical negligence or medical malpractice. And if we look at Reyes versus Sisters of Mercy Hospital, 
it defines it is defined rather as a failure of the physician to exhibit that degree of care which is ordinarily employed by the profession under similar conditions and in like surrounding circumstances. When we therefore test what degree of care a physician should exercise to be that which is prevailing in the locality, this is to say that we have adopted what is known as the locality rule. And this goes into the very um, importance of what needed to be established in a medical malpractice case. So there is a two-pronged evidence that has to be shown. The evidence of what is the recognized standard of care in the medical community. And second, that the physician um, in involved has departed negligently from that standard. So almost always, this is shown by expert testimony. But there's one nice, uh, nice. There's one uh, unique case of Ramos versus the Court of Appeals, where the Supreme Court uh, used the doctrine of res ipsa locator. The Supreme Court said, ordinarily, a person being put under anesthesia is not rendered decerebrate as a consequence of administering that anesthesia. But because in this case, she was rendered so, res ipsa locator can come in. So you need not prove, uh, rather exhibit expert evidence. Mm. Other defenses in a medical malpractice case would be reasonable diligence, or if it was in fact the plaintiff's negligence that caused the incident from happening. And then in this case of uh, Lee, you have this doctrine of informed consent. Hospitals are liable under the doctrine of or concept of agency by implication or estoppel. So when a hospital publicly displays in its lobby the names and specializations of the physicians associated with it, it is now stopped from passing all the blame to that physician in saying that he was not really an employee of the hospital. The Supreme Court used the doctrine or the concept of agency by implication or by estoppel. And this was in fact reiterated in this, this concept rather of doctrine of ostensible uh, agency in the case of City State Savings Bank versus Tubia decided by the court in 2018. Mm, the captain of the ship rule was um, uh, implanted here although of U.S. Uh, origin, in the case of professional services versus Agana. And here, the operating surgeon was made responsible because he is the person in complete charge of the surgery room and all the personnel connected with the operation. Let me very quickly discuss torts and private, uh, data privacy laws. This is one brand of tort known as privacy tort. And uh, extensive work has been um, written on this one by Chief Justice Luke Bersamin in his concurring and dissenting opinion in this really nice case of Polio versus David decided in October 18, 2011 by Supreme Court Unbank. Let me just um, highlight what CJ uh, Bersamin said here. In 1960, Tort Scholar Prozer published in California Law Review his article entitled Privacy, based on his thorough review of the various decisions of the US courts and privacy laws. The laws of privacy comprises four distinct kinds of invasion of four different interests of the plaintiff. He then classified these privacy torts into four aspects. First, intrusion upon plaintiff's solitude or into his private affairs. Second, the public disclosure of embarrassing private facts about the plaintiff. Third, the publicity that places the plaintiff in a false light in the public eye. And fourth, the appropriation for the defendant's advantage of the plaintiff's name or likeness. He said, um, these are altogether very different interests of plaintiff. They're only tied together by common name because they're all founded on the right of a person to be let alone. So there are four aspects of privacy tort. Tort of intrusion upon seclusion or solitude happens when a person intentionally intrudes 
physically or otherwise upon the solitude or seclusion of another in a manner that was highly offensive to a reasonable person. There's tort of public disclosure of private facts. There's also tort of putting a person in false light. And these two happens when the publicized matter was highly offensive to a reasonable person and was not in any way a legitimate concern of the public such that it placed that person before the public in a false light. So it's a private fact which was not of legitimate concern to the public. Um, had we had the benefit of time, this would have allowed us to explore the aspects of uh, when is a fact private. Um, you need to look at the, uh, the personality of the person involved. There are public officials. And then there are private persons that are, however, considered persons over whom the public has interest in. And then there are private persons. Um, then there are facts that are that may be private, but over which the person, uh, the public rather, has a legitimate concern. So all of these go into whether disclosure was uh, valid or legitimate. So these four privacy torts had to be taken in the light of two categories of privacy claims. There's informational privacy, which refers to the interest in avoiding disclosure of personal matters. And then there is decisional privacy of a person, which refers to the interest in independence in making certain kinds of important decisions concerning speech, religion, personal relations, education, and sexual preferences. In the case of Polio versus the deed, an unbanked ruling of the court, this one's a really interesting case because this involves a search of office computer assigned to a government employee. Now, this is a government issued computer assigned to a government employee who was charged administratively and eventually dismissed from service. The employee's personal files were stored in that computer and were used by the government as evidence of his misconduct. He said that the seizure of his personal files is unconstitutional, especially that it was done without a warrant. But civil service commission argued that here civil service was acting not as a government agent or a law enforcer, but as an employer. And it art and civil service commission argued where the government as employer invades the private files of an employee stored in the computer assigned to him for his official use. In the course of initial investigation of a possible misconduct, the government agency acts in its capacity as employer rather than a law enforcer. In deciding whether uh, the files, the personal files that were confiscated and seized from the com computer issued by the government, with uh, the seizure of which was without any warrant, the Supreme Court uh, asked two important questions. Did the employee have reasonable expectation of privacy? And is the employer government's intrusion reasonable under the circumstances? Tackling first the issue of whether an employee had reasonable expectation of privacy, Supreme Court took note of Civil Service Commission's Office Memorandum Number 10, Series of 2002, the Computer Use Policy. And there, the Supreme Court said, looking at the CUP, the, re the employee concerned here does not really have a reasonable expectation of privacy. So I'm sure you are curious as to what the policy was. Here is uh, the relevant portion of the policy. It says here, computers that had been issued um, remain to be uh, properties of government and can only be used for legitimate business purposes. There is no expectation of privacy. Users understand that, uh, there, uh, that anything that they create, store, send, or receive in the computer system will not be covered by a reasonable expectation of privacy, except the members of the commission. And it is this phrase, except the members of the commission, that made senior associate Justice Carpio um, write a separate opinion on the matter. 
And in fact, the same policy reads, there is waiver of privacy rights. The user of the computer expressly waive any right to privacy in anything they create, store, send, or receive in the computer. Um, here, there was a password that was placed, but the policy uh, said, even if you do not have a, even if you do not, even if you do have a password, it does not, passwords do not imply privacy. The use of passwords to gain access to the computer system does not imply that users have expectation of privacy. So the Supreme Court ruled with this policy in place, then there really is no re reasonable expectation of privacy on the part of the employee concerned in the use of the computer. And so the question that was next asked was the, was the seizure of the personal files in that government issued computer reasonable, especially that it was done sans warrant. There the court ruled it was the computers that, was, that were subjected to the search and it was justified since these furnished the easiest means for an employee to encode and store documents. Indeed, the computers would be a likely starting point in ferreting out incriminating evidence. Concomitantly, the ephemeral nature of computer files, that is that they could easily be destroyed at the click of a button, necessitated immediate action. Um, so this was the ruling of the court in 2011, three years later. You have uh, Vivares versus STC, where Supreme Court also said that Images, though personal in nature, when posted in Facebook that was not placed on an only me set setting, um, there can be no reasonable expectation of privacy with respect to the photographs in question. So having said that, we look at the four aspects of privacy tort and uh, read that in the light of Data Privacy Act of 2012 your RA-10173, which detailed uh, what are the kinds of personal information, sensitive personal information, what may be legally done about it, and what are the exemptions. I only have eight minutes left. So let me just... Uh, highlight instead... Uh, four important rulings of the court affecting damages. Let me just say uh, the aspect of damages had been uh, a subject of really weighty bar questions in the past. In 2009, for instance, 3% had been allocated on question on damages. But especially in 2013 bar, question number two was worth 8% and it was about damages. But for lack of time, let me very quickly move to... The case of People versus Hugueta, decided by Supreme Court Unbanked in 2016. Here, you really need to have a look at this one because it is in this case that the Supreme Court detailed uh, the extent of civil indemnity uh, or, or the extent of damages that may be awarded in various crimes that a person may commit. So this is a very, very extensive list of the amount of damages or civil indemnity that may be given. And please have a look, therefore, especially that it's an unbanked ruling, uh, have a look at people versus Hugueta. Seven minutes um, on interest. Three cases come into play. Eastern Shipping Lines, um, the old case governing interest, then the case of NACAR versus Gallery Frames, decided by the Supreme Court Unbank in 2013, August also. And then Lara's Gifts and Decors, decided by the Supreme Court um, Unbank on August 28, 2019. So Eastern Shipping has to be read alongside uh, first NACAR and then Lara's Gifts. Let me just spend the remaining six minutes walking us through first Eastern Shipping and then NACAR and then ending it with a discussion on Lara's gifts. 
Eastern Shipping case presented to us uh, three scenarios. An obligation consisting of loan or forbearance of money, an obligation not constituting loan or forbearance of money, and then the judgment that will uh, tackle either one or two, either one of the two scenarios. If the obligation consists in the payment of sum of money, that is, it is a loan or forbearance of money, uh, you go by the stipulated interest. But in the absence of stipulation, the rate of interest shall be 12% to be computed from default. That is, from judicial or extrajudicial demand under Article 1169. So, if loan or forbearance of money, interest shall be that which has been stipulated upon. But in the absence of stipulation, it will be 12% per annum computed from default. If the obligation is not constituting loan or forbearance of money, the interest shall be at the rate of 6% per annum. There is a special mention here by the court where the Supreme Court held where the demand is not established with certainty, the interest shall begin to run only from the date the judgment of the court is made. So for instance, I ask for actual damages. That's not constitutive of a loan or forbearance of money. And I say that based on this computation, uh, the actual damages I am sustaining is 1 million. Uh, it can be argued that that demand can be established with reasonable certainty, or that amount rather can be established with reasonable certainty at the time that you made the demand. But if your claim is, is such that I am asking for 1 million for the moral damages I sustain, that is a kind of demand that cannot be established yet with reasonable certainty because the amount of the moral damages we will be awarded with depends really on the discretion of the court. And so because it is such an obligation not constituting a loan or forbearance of money and the demand cannot yet be established with reasonable certainty at the time it is made, the interest of 6% shall begin to run only from the date judgment of the court was made. And then the scenario is that in either way, whether it's a loan or not loan, the judgment that has been made by the court shall earn interest at the rate of 12% per annum from finality of that judgment until its satisfaction. The reasoning of the court is that uh, from the time the judgment has become final, it is transformed into that of a uh, obligation constitutive of a uh, almost like a loan it, uh, because in that sense the uh, judgment debtor owed that amount to the judgment creditor so that's the reason why 12 percent was in, to be imposed um, from finality of the judgment until its satisfaction then so Banco Central ng Pilipinas passed circular 799 series of 2013 and here it says, in the absence of express contract as to rate of interest, legal interest shall be 6% per annum, which made the court issue a new guideline modifying Eastern Shipping in the case of NACAR. So very quickly, let me just, because there's no more time, give you a sample dispositive portion of the court in 2018. The amount of 950 pesos shall earn interest at the rate of 12% per annum from date of demand in 2005 until June 30, 2013. And after June 30, 2013, interest at the rate of 6% shall then be computed up to the date of finality of the decision. The damages, moral and exemplary, shall earn interest at the rate of 6%. But look at the ruling of the court from the time of the finality of this decision. 
more will be said on that one as we look at this case of Lara's gifts decided by the Supreme Court through the pen of Associate Justice, Senior Associate Justice uh, Carpio. In Lara's gift, the Supreme Court looked at the scenario where there is in fact a stipulated interest, parties stipulated an interest in writing. What then to do with that one? If there is a stipulated interest, that will prevail, provided it is not excessive and unconscionable until full payment without compounding unless compounding is expressly stipulated by parties. So if it consists of a loan or forbearance of money and there is a stipulated interest, that is what will prevail until full payment. In other words, you don't ship it to 12% as was first announced in uh, Eastern Shipping uh, from the finality of judgment until full payment. The stipulated rate of interest will be the one that will control until full payment um, because precisely that is what has been stipulated by parties. That is on the principal obligation. The interest on the principal shall be separately earning interest at the legal rate prescribed by Banco Central from the time of judicial demand until full payment. If the obligation is not a loan or forbearance of money, what will prevail will be the rate of interest prescribed by central bank, which shall be computed from default until full payment without compounding. So that if it is such that the damages had been uh, reasonably ascertained already by the judgment of the court, the reckoning point of imposition of interest shall be from the date of the judgment of the trial court even if later on the case was brought on appeal to the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court. So um, this is best understood when we look at the dispositive portion of the judgment in Lara's gift. The amount of 1 million representing the principal amount with stipulated interest of 24% had been imposed, computed from 2008 the date of extrajudicial demand until full payment. So all the way up to the full payment of the obligation, it has been the stipulated interest that will govern. On the other hand, legal interest on the stipulated interest shall also be imposed and it will be first 12% from date of demand in 2008 until June 30, 2013. And then it will become 6% from 1 July 2013 until its full payment. There's attorney's fees and it will earn 6% of the interest to be computed from finality of the decision until full payment. Um, the change really had to be so because the Supreme Court ruled if the rate of interest is stipulated, provided it is not excessive or unconscionable, that stipulated interest shall be applied until full payment because that is the law between the parties. So these are the important uh, changes. There had been others, but I think that um, for lack of time, we will just have to focus um, on NACAR and then Lara's gifts and the course. Um, I should already close this session uh, by thanking you all for tuning in to Paul's live lecture series.